Hello, 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 hello. This is Dr. Bandic. Welcome back to Introduction to Philosophy. This is Lecture 2, and in this lecture, we're going to be continuing to present an overview of what's to come in the rest of this course. And in this video, we're going to be focusing on giving an overview of three of our main topics, ethics, knowledge, and reality. In lecture one, a lot of the discussion there had to do with a definition of philosophy as the pursuit of a priori knowledge concerning topics that are fundamental to all other knowledge and ways of living. And in this video, as well as in the next video, the focus is going to be on these topics. The last video spent a lot of time talking about the method of philosophy, what it meant to try to pursue a priori knowledge. That's going to keep coming up. We're going to be talking about arguments and reasoning, but um, our main focus is going to be about conveying the gist of some of the main topics, in particular, the three topics, ethics, knowledge, and reality. In many ways, those, are, those three topics are the biggest topics in philosophy. Another way to put it would be to say these are the three main categories of philosophical topics in philosophy. Yet another way to put it would be to say that philosophy has three branches and these topics, ethics, knowledge, and reality each get their own branch of philosophy. Some terms that you may have been exposed to before or perhaps instead are, are new to you are the terms metaphysics and epistemology. Metaphysics and epistemology are two of the three main branches of philosophy, ethics being the third branch. Metaphysics is the portion of philosophy that is primarily concerned with existence and reality, especially as accessible to an a priori methodology. What we uh, can access via just reason about the ultimate nature of reality. That is the domain of metaphysics. Epistemology is the philosophical study of knowledge and questions pertaining to knowledge, like what justifies knowledge, whether there is any knowledge, what are the main sources of knowledge. Epistemology is one of the main branches of philosophy and its special domain is knowledge. And then there is ethics, which has as its domain topics that have to do with value. The value of actions, like which actions are right, which are wrong. The value of certain goals, like the value of friendship, or the value of money, the value of life itself. So there are three branches to philosophy, and everything that you study in philosophy falls under one of these branches or some combination of these branches. So this video is going to be about ethics, knowledge, and reality. The next video is going to give an overview of three additional major topics, God, free will, and mind. And those topics we could see as falling under one or more of these. So for example, when we talk about God in the next video, a lot of the issues are going to fall under metaphysics, although they do get into some stuff concerning epistemology and ethics. But anyway, um, I'd like to take these in, in turn, and let's start with ethics. And the, Again, the point here is to give an introductory overview. We're going to get a lot more um, exploration of ethics in later videos. The point here is to just give you a bit of a, a deeper feel for it than you got in the previous video. So one of the things that I talked about a lot in lecture one is the difference between philosophy and religion. And philosophy and religion, despite being different, they have a lot of similarities. They're both interested in ethics and right and wrong. They're interested in ultimate topics like the nature of existence, the question of whether existence has a creator. And you might think about philosophical ethics by thinking about 
religious ethics and thinking of the contrast. So let's start with uh, an approach to ethics that is explicitly religious, and this is an approach to ethics that sometimes gets referred to as divine command theory. We might put the idea of divine command theory as the idea that all right and wrong comes from a divine source. It comes from God or it comes from the gods. You're going to get a different kind of version of this depending on what religion you're dealing with. So in a monotheistic religion, like for example Islam or Judaism, there's only going to be one God that's referred to, but there could be versions of divine command theory that are proper to polytheistic religions where there are multiple gods and the source of ethics according to those versions of divine command theory are going to be one or more of the many gods that are believed to exist in those religions. Anyway, we could put the idea of divine command theory as something like the, the moral law is the law put forth by God or the gods. So according to divine command theory, morality or ethics, which is in, in for the purposes of this course, the same thing. There's really no difference between morality or ethics. Morality is essentially connected to religion, according to divine command theory. If we're dealing with a monotheistic version, we could say without God there is no morality, or we could change that to without the gods there is no morality. One way we could put it is to say that God's love makes things good, or God's will makes things good. And um, similarly, w things are bad according because God said so. So why is it wrong to commit murder? Why is it wrong to tell a lie? Well, because God said it's wrong. Why is it good to worship God or to give glory to God? Well, because God said so. That's why it's good. There's no further question. The, the buck stops with God. Now, um, even though this is a religious view, this all uh, is something that has been very interesting to philosophers. Philosophers have wondered whether this could be given a, a philosophically satisfying uh, basis, or whether instead there's something philosophically wrong with it. The, the, maybe there's something that reason reveals to be unsatisfying. And one very famous discussion of that idea that there's something wrong um, with the divine command theory is something that we could trace way back to ancient Greece and one of the most significant philosophers in the Western European tradition and that is the philosopher Plato. Plato is in many ways considered um, the, the greatest philosopher in the Western tradition and um, there's a famous line about Plato that all of philosophy is footnotes to Plato. Anyway, Plato, I think his reputation is well deserved. He was an incredibly deep thinker and an amazing writer. And one way in which we know about Plato is through the various things that he wrote. And further, these things that he wrote were all in the form of dialogues. They are actually very enjoyable to read. And one thing that comes through in the dialogues is his focus on his teacher, the philosopher Socrates. Socrates himself didn't write anything down, but um, many things were written by him. And the most famous person to write about Socrates was Plato. Plato wrote various dialogues in which Socrates was talking to somebody, and the names of the dialogues get named after the main person that Socrates is talking to. We're going to be focusing on a dialogue of Plato's called the Euthyphro, a dialogue in which Socrates is having a conversation with an individual named Euthyphro. Once in a while I might mention dates in this course, and I, I want to emphasize that they're not real important. I'm not going to be quizzing you on what Plato's birthday was, but I think it is nonetheless kind of interesting to know that we're dealing with figures from over 2,000 years ago as opposed to just 200 years ago. It helps us understand where they're coming from to have a little bit of sense of how long ago they were alive and what the historical context was that they are emerging from. So Socrates and Plato are figures from ancient Greece and um, Socrates came 
first. He was a little bit older than Plato and was born in approximately uh, 469 BC, died in 399 BC. Um, but like I said, the dates aren't super important. Every so often I'll just put them up on the slide to give you a bit of context. But anyway, we're going to look at something called the Euthyphro objection. This is an objection to divine command theory that's developed in the Euthyphro dialogue. And we could convey the, the objection in connection with the story that's told in the, the dialogue of the Euthyphro. One thing that uh, you may have heard about Socrates is that he was tried, found guilty, and put to death by the citizens of Athens. And in the dialogue of the Euthyphro, Socrates is awaiting his day in court. He's standing in front of the courthouse. Soon he's going to go on trial. And while he's waiting for his turn to go in the courthouse, he sees someone who he knows, Euthyphro. Euthyphro walks by, and he's heading into the court. And Socrates stops Euthyphro and says, Euthyphro, what are you doing? Why, why are you going to court? And Euthyphro says, I have a trial to go to. And Socrates says, that's interesting. Soon I'm going to be on trial. Maybe you can give me some advice. Tell me, Euthyphro, why are you going to trial? And Euthyphro says that, well, he's going to trial, he's going to court to testify against his own father. Euthyphro is going to testify against his father. And to make a long story short, Euthyphro is going to be testifying that his father committed murder. Um, his father owned slaves and mistreated one of the slaves and it led to the slave's death. It, would, it was kind of controversial at the time for someone to be testifying against their father about a slave. And Socrates thought that that was a bit puzzling and asked Euthyphro, why are you doing this, this kind of controversial thing? Yes, maybe it's bad to kill a slave, but to speak out against your father, that seems a bit odd from the point of view of ancient Athenians. Anyway, Euthyphro's answer to Socrates is he's doing it because it is the pious thing to do, that it is a holy thing. One way of putting it is, Euthyphro is telling Socrates that he's doing this because this is the God's will. This is the will of the gods. Now Socrates asks a question, and the question that he poses to Euthyphro is something that we might put like this. Are things good because God loves them, or does God love them because they are good? We could ask this question in connection with gods versus a single god. It doesn't matter for the main philosophical point. But are things good because the gods love them, or vice versa, the gods love them because those things are good? So take, for example, telling the truth. What makes it good to tell the truth? Is it good independently of the gods, and they love it because it's good? They recognize that it's good, and so they love it? Think about the relationship you have to things that you would say that you love. Maybe you love ice cream. Do you love ice cream because it's good? Or is it good because you love it? Um, you might be inclined to say that you love it because it tastes good. If I asked you why you love ice cream, you might say, well, I, the, the flavor is a great flavor. And it's because it's a great flavor that you like it. If it had a terrible flavor, you wouldn't like it. If the flavor changed, then you wouldn't like it anymore. It's not the other way around. Um, it seems that uh, usually the reason you like something is because it's got some quality that makes you like it and not the other way around. Now, once in a while, you can make something be good. Maybe you're making a cake and the cake tastes good. And we ask you, why does this cake taste good? And you can say, well, I made it that way. I made it to taste good. But why do you love that taste? And why is that taste good? Those are two separate questions, and you might wonder which of those questions is more important. Do you like it because it tastes good, or does it taste good because you like it? That's the sort of question that the, the Euthyphro objection is getting at. So anyway, here we go. Uh, let's review this a little bit to see where we're at. We've got Euthyphro and Socrates. Euthyphro is 
basically asserting something that is similar to divine command theory. Euthyphro is saying that God's love or God's will makes things good. And Socrates is wondering, like, well, does that really make sense? So let's take something that is allegedly good and something that is loved by the gods, and we've got to ask ourselves, are those things good because God loves them, or does God love them because they are good? If you think about the logic of this question, realize it's got to be one or the other. It's an either-or statement, or it's an either-or question, and the answer has to be it's either the one way or it's the other way. We can state the main idea here in terms of what's known as a dilemma. So either, number one, things are good because God loves them, or God loves them because they are good. Which one is it? Well, it turns out that either one is going to lead to problems, problems for divine command theory. So let's focus on number two that says God loves them because they are good. Well, what's the problem with that? Well, the problem is that if God loves them because they're good, it seems like that would make being good logically independent of God. They're good prior to God, but then that just makes God irrelevant to whether they're good. That doesn't mean God's irrelevant, it just means that God's irrelevant for that question. Why are these things good? And then that just contradicts divine command theory. So you would say that, well, if divine command theory is going to be true, then number two can't be true. So then number one is going to have to be true on the assumption that either one or two is true. If two can't be true on the assumption of divine command theory, that leaves number one, that things are good because God loves them. But is there a problem with that? Yes, there's a big problem with that. It makes it look like God loves things for no reason, which makes God seem to be irrational. If God, uh, let's put it like this, if, um, if the thing isn't good until God loves it, then why does God love it? Does God have any reason for loving it? When you love things like ice cream, you have a reason for loving it. Your reason for loving it is that it has a, a pleasing flavor. So you love it because it's good. But if there was something that was neither good nor bad until you came along and you just decided you're going to love it. So like there's some dog you meet a dog, and the dog is completely neutral. The dog is not particularly cute, but it's not particularly ugly either. You don't love it, or you hate it. And then you decide, for no reason at all, that you're going to love that dog. And then now, the dog is good. Why is the dog good? Well, I love that dog. That's the best dog. Well, why is it the best dog? Well, I just decided. Well, why did you decide? Did you decide because it was handsome? No, I didn't think it looked any particular way, one way or the other. It wasn't ugly. It wasn't pretty. I just decided that from now on I like that dog. It, it makes it look like you're deciding to love that dog for no reason at all. But that seems like it's irrational, and this first option seems to make God irrational. There's other problems besides. If whether something is good or bad is just up to whether God says so or not, it becomes very difficult to distinguish God from anything else that is maybe not God. There might be multiple beings, and you're trying to decide which one is the one worth worshiping. Well, there's this one being that decides that it loves dogs, and so therefore they're good. And there's another being that decides that it loves fire, and so therefore it's good. And there's another being that decides it likes torturing people, and so therefore that's good. Well, which one of these is Satan? Which one of these is God? Which one of these are you going to follow and worship? If whether they're good or bad is something that is just completely determined independently of whether they like it or not, then you've got a way of choosing. You could say, like, well, I'm going to worship the good one. But if being good is just up to the decider, then you've got no way of choosing which one is the good one. So... The problem raised by the Euthyphro objection or the Euthyphro dilemma has led a lot of philosophers to think that whatever morality or ethics is, it's got to be something that's logically independent of religion. One way of putting this point is to say there's got to be some kind of secular or non-religious way of establishing the rational basis of ethics and being ethical. 
Well, what could that possibly be? If, there, if you're not going to rely on God to figure out what makes right and wrong, what are you going to rely on? The question then becomes, how can a morality be established independently of religion? How could just reason allow us to establish the truth of ethics and morality? One of the big theories that we're going to be looking at in this course is a theory known as utilitarianism. And maybe you've heard of this one before, or maybe this seems obvious to you. You thought of it yourself. And the idea goes something like this. Ethics doesn't really have anything to do with God. Maybe God exists. Maybe God doesn't exist. But ethics is not really based on God. What ethics is based on is whether people are happy or not. It has to do not just with you and whether you're happy. Ethics is not just about what you want, but it's what people in general or in the statistical uh, average, what they want. And we might put it in terms of happiness or we might put it in terms of pleasure. We might put it in terms of a ratio of happiness and pleasure in over like pain and suffering. So what you're striving for when you're being ethical, when you're doing things ethically, you're striving to create the greatest amount of happiness relative to pain and suffering in the greatest number of people. So we might put the basic idea of utilitarianism in terms of something like uh, a moral choice or a moral dilemma. One very extreme version of a moral dilemma is the one illustrated by the classical trolley problem. So suppose one day you're walking along and you see a, a runaway trolley car. This trolley car is barreling down these tracks. There's you, you're walking along and you see there's this lever. You put your hand on the lever and you're about to throw the lever. But you wonder, well, is this really the right thing to do? If you push or pull the lever, what's going to happen is that this trolley will be diverted, and instead of going in a straight line and killing these five people, it'll turn and it'll go on this other track and just kill one person. If you don't pull the lever, the trolley will just continue on in a straight line and kill five. So you have a choice now. The choice is to pull the lever or not. If you pull the lever, you'll save, if you pull the lever, you'll save five people's lives. If you pull the lever, five will be saved. If you don't pull the lever, five will die. So, from the point of view of utilitarianism, what should you do? Well, let's go back. Utilitarianism says an action is right insofar as it maximizes the ratio of pleasure over pain for the population overall, and wrong if it does the opposite. So what's the population overall? Well, there's a whole bunch of people in the United States population, and there's five of them right there on this track, there's one of them right there on this track, and then there's you. You might say you might be a little bit unhappy about having to pull this lever, but at least you saved five lives, and it's sad that this person has to die, but overall, these people will be happy that they lived, and so will their families be happy. So overall, you're making more people in the population happy than if you didn't pull the lever. If you didn't pull the lever, well, all these people are going to die and their families are going to find out that you just stood there and didn't pull the lever. They're going to be pretty upset. You're still going to be sad anyway. And uh, yeah, sure, this person survived. They might be happy that you just stood there staring at the lever and not pulling it. But nonetheless, you've created a lot more unhappiness through your inaction. So the idea is one that we might put in a kind of mathematical way that whether something is right or wrong has to do with a mathematical calculation of how much happiness the action is going to bring about versus how much pain or suffering it avoids. Now that's not the end of the story. There's a lot of problems with utilitarianism. You might say that it's not obvious that it's right to sacrifice lives. You might think that you should never intervene in these sorts of situations. Yeah, it's horrible that this event is happening, but it's even more horrible for you to intervene and make this one person have to sacrifice themselves. There's other reasons to think maybe there's something wrong with utilitarianism. What about situations in which the majority does something really, really horrible to a minority of the population? Does that make it okay if the majority really enjoys it? They really get a lot of pleasure out of torturing a small number of people. That doesn't seem right. So there's a lot more to say 
about how it is that we can establish a non-religious basis for ethics or morality. We'll talk about utilitarianism a lot more. We'll talk about some alternatives to utilitarianism, but throughout our quest is going to be to see to what degree ethics and morality can be based in reason. Let's move on and talk about epistemology, the branch of philosophy that has to do with knowledge. Some of the most important things that we need to establish early on in our discussion of the philosophy of knowledge or epistemology is to understand a difference between three very important concepts. The concept of truth, the concept of belief, and the concept of knowledge. They're closely related, but nonetheless they're different. And one way to get um, a handle on the difference between truth, belief, and knowledge is through something that comes from child psychology. It's a task known as the false belief task. It's a task that you are going to perform while listening to a story. This is a story that we can present to small children or we can present to young adults and we can ask them certain questions and when you answer the question you're performing the task. And it's a task about false belief and let's listen to the story, see how it goes. So um, here's there are two main characters in the story. This is Sally, and this is Anne. I'll, uh, if it isn't clear, uh, the there's two girls, two little girls. The girl on the left of the screen is Sally, and the girl on the right of the screen is Anne. Sally has a basket. There's her basket, and Anne has a box. There's Anne's box. They're inside. Uh, they're in, in in the house. Right now, playing a little bit later, Sally's going to go outside and play. Uh, so that's the first part of the story, introducing Sally and Ann and Sally's basket and Ann's box. Um, Sally has a marble, and this thing is huge. Look at that. It's like more like a bowling ball. But anyway, there's Sally's marble, and Sally takes the marble, and she puts her marble into a basket. One thing to notice here is there's a blanket over the basket. So the marble is going to go in the basket and be covered up with a blanket. Sally takes her marble and she puts it into the basket. And here's Anne. She's watching this whole thing go down. All right, so Sally goes out for a walk. She's going to go outside and play. She has left her marble in the basket. And Anne has been watching this whole thing. What's Anne going to do? Well, Anne is a little bit naughty. And Anne goes over to the basket. She takes the marble out of the basket. She puts it into the box. Okay, now Sally comes back. Anne is not around anymore, apparently. So, but Sally comes back, and she wants to play with her marble. And here's the important question. Where will Sally look for the marble? So if this was like a puppet show that you were showing to kids, like little kids, you might show them the puppet Sally and... Anne and tell them about the marble and the basket and all that. And at the end of the story, you ask the little kids, where will Sally look for the, her marble? But we could ask you also, even though you're not a little kid, where is Sally going to look for her marble? You might say, this is really easy. Obviously, where Sally is going to look for the marble is in the basket. Sally put the marble in the basket and has got no reason to think it's anywhere but in the basket, so that's where she's going to look. And we might say, Sally is going to look for her marble in the basket because she believes that the marble is in the basket. Now, of course, we know better. We know that the marble is not in the basket. And so, therefore, we could describe Sally's belief as a false belief. We, the audience of this story, understand that Sally has a false belief. And this is actually a very difficult thing for small children to understand. It takes a few years before you understand this, children under the age of four don't do very well at the false belief task. They can't really separate their view of reality from other people's view of reality. Uh, a similar point that is a true of, of children under four also is true of uh, many autistic children, even if they're over the age of four. Well, those are facts from a psychology class. We're not really here for the psychological points we're here for the philosophical point, the point that helps us distinguish truth from belief. Since Sally can have a false belief, that must show us that belief and truth are not the same thing. Some beliefs are true, some beliefs are false. So I said the point of this story was to help us understand 
a distinction not only between belief and truth, but also between belief, truth, and knowledge. And so let's talk about knowledge by changing the story slightly. So we're still going to have Annie and, and Sally, but instead of calling this the belief, the false belief task, we're going to call it the knowledge task. Okay, so the story starts off pretty much the same as the story before. So there's Sally, and she's got a basket. And there's Anne, and she has a box. Sally has a marble, and she puts her marble in her basket, and then Sally goes out for a walk. Now here's where the story gets slightly different. So Anne is going to get up, and she's going to take the marble out of the basket and put it in the box, and then, here's the different thing, she's going to take it, from the box and back, put it back into the basket. Okay, so all of this is happening while Sally is gone. First, before Sally left, Sally put her marble in the basket, and then Sally leaves. And while Sally is gone, Anne goes and takes the marble out of the basket, puts it in the box, and then takes it out of the box and puts it back in the basket again. Okay, then Sally comes back, and now I'm going to ask you a different question from the question I asked you at the end of the previous story. Does Sally know where the marble is? Now, that's a question about knowledge. I'm not asking you what she believes. I'm asking you what she knows. It should be obvious to you what she believes. She believes the same thing she believed in the previous story, that the marble is in the basket. Because just like in the previous story, she was outside and so had no reason to believe that the marble was anywhere besides where she left it. However, does she know that the marble's in the basket? Given how easy it is for her belief to be false, it's hard to say that she knows it. We might say that for all she knows, the marble has been put in a box given how easy it is for her, to, for her to get fooled. So, if we ask the question, does Sally know that the marble is in the basket? The answer seems to be no. She does not know that the marble is in the basket. Yes, she believes that the marble is in the basket. And in this version of the story, that belief is a true belief. But true belief doesn't seem to be enough for knowledge. Just because you have a true belief doesn't mean you have knowledge. We might put the point like this, if your belief is just accidentally true, that's not good enough for, for knowledge. But the main point here is that knowledge is not the same as true belief. So belief is not the same as truth. Sometimes you can have true beliefs, but other times you can have false beliefs. So therefore, being true is not the same as being believed. And just because you have a true belief doesn't mean you have knowledge. Now that raises some really deep and interesting questions that we'll be talking about in later videos about like, what is knowledge? How much do you have to have to have knowledge? What besides true belief do you need to have to have knowledge? But one thing that I want to talk a little bit more is a puzzle that arises when we start thinking about belief and falsehood and knowledge. If we think about the ways in which our beliefs might be false, that really makes us doubt that we have any knowledge at all. And one way of putting this point is in terms of the famous brain in a vat thought experiment. Here's the thought experiment. Imagine one night while you're sleeping, the evil scientists come and they remove your brain. They keep your brain alive, but they remove it from your body, all while you're unconscious. And they take it and they put it into a vat and they hook the vat up to a computer in such a way that there's wires going from the computer going to your brain. And so instead of receiving electrochemical signals from your eyeballs and your ears and your other sensory organs, you're receiving the same signals but from a computer. These signals would trigger you to say things like, I'm outside walking in the sun, when actually you're floating in the dark in your brain vat hooked up to a computer. The basic ideas of the brain in the vat thought experiment are the sorts of ideas that were put forward in the Matrix movie from 1999. And maybe you saw the movie The Matrix. We could take the brain in the vat idea and put it in the form of an argument, the conclusion of which is that for all you know, you might be a brain in a vat. What are the premises of the argument? We've got two of them. The first premise is something that we could call the causal theory of perception. A percept and its perceptual object occupy distinct positions in a causal chain. 
you might put the idea like this. When you have a perception, that's something that's happening in your mind. So like right now, I'm perceiving my water bottle. Well, the water bottle is one thing. There, there it is. There's my water bottle. The water bottle is one thing. It's out here. But my perception of the water bottle is something happening in my mind. So what is the relationship between what's happening in my mind and what's happening in the environment? Well, it's some kind of causal relationship. This is the cause and ener light energy bounces off of the bottle and it goes in my eye and that sends signals to my brain and that gives rise to a perception and that's the effect. We've got cause and effect whenever we have a perceptual situation. The cause is the perceptual object. In that case, it was the bottle. That's the perceptual object. But the mental event is the percept or the perception. And those are distinct links in a causal chain. The second premise is that for any particular cause and any particular effect, they are logically independent of one another. What it means to say that one thing is logically independent of the other is that you could have the one without the other. This is the kind of idea that we were talking about in connection with the Euthyphro dilemma and the proposition that maybe morality is logically independent of God. If they're logically independent, you can have one without the other. Let's spell this out a little bit more detail. So the causal theory of perception holds that a percept and its perceptual object occupy distinct positions in a causal chain. So what it means for there to be distinct positions in a causal chain is that you have at least two events, one of which is the cause and the other of which is the effect. But if you've got a causal chain, you might have many more links in the chain than that. So you've got this spoon, and that causes light to bounce off the spoon, which causes it to travel through the air, which causes it to go into your eyes, which causes certain photoreceptors in your eyes to be stimulated, which causes it to send certain electrical signals to your brain. Those are a bunch of events that are arranged in a chain of cause and effect, the way in which different dominoes in a chain of dominoes can cause each successive domino to fall down. The two main links in the chain that are important is the perceptual object, the thing that you perceive, which is the spoon, and the idea in your mind, the idea of a spoon, that's the effect. The second premise tells us that whenever we have cause and effect like that, we have logically independent events. Whenever one thing causes another, if that's a genuine case of causation, it's logically possible to have the one thing without the other. So, for example, if the cause of this hole in the window is this baseball flew into it, if it's really a causal relationship, then it's logically possible to have the one thing without the other. It's logically possible to have the window have a hole in it, but something else caused it. Maybe other times in which windows are broken, it wasn't a baseball that hit them, but someone accidentally hit it with a, a broom handle. They were trying to kill a fly with a broom, and the broom cracked the window. It had nothing to do with a baseball. There's lots of ways to break a window. That's cause and effect. There's, for any given effect, there's a lot of different ways you could have caused it. If instead you've got a situation where the two things are not logically independent, then that's not a causal situation. So let's take the relationship between a polygon having three sides and that polygon having three angles. The one doesn't cause the other. It's not like first you have three sides and then that makes you have three angles, or vice versa. You don't start off with three angles and then now you have three sides. Having three sides and having three angles are just the same thing, logically. You can't have the one without the other. So it doesn't make sense to say that the one is causing the other. So if you are perceiving something, then that means that the thing that you perceive might not actually exist. It might instead be replaced with some other cause. You could have the same effect in your brain, but instead of a real spoon, there's just some electricity in a computer that you're hooked up to in a brain in a bat scenario. And that raises the general question of whether anyone knows anything, and if they do, how do they know it? Or should we instead adopt a general view of skepticism that says there just is no knowledge? I'm going to start moving to the third branch of philosophy, which is metaphysics. We had just been talking about epistemology, 
because we were talking about knowledge. Metaphysics and epistemology are very closely related. One way of talking about the relationship between metaphysics and epistemology, the way in which you might try to talk about them at the same time, is through a pair of philosophical questions. One of which is, what is the mind such that it can know the world? And another question is, what is the world such that it can be known by the mind? So up here I've got metaphysics illustrated by a blue shape and epistemology illustrated by a green shape. And then in these sentences, I've got blue words and green words. And the blue is supposed to correspond to metaphysics and the green is supposed to correspond to epistemology. So in our first question, what is the mind such that it can know the world? We're talking about knowledge and a knowledge relationship between the mind and the world. But we're also asking a metaphysical question about the mind and a metaphysical question about the world. What is the nature of the mind? That's a metaphysical question. Do minds exist? What is the nature of mental existence? And we might ask similar questions about the world and how can the existence of the world be such that it would allow the mind to have knowledge of it? And conversely, we might ask, what is the mind such that it can know the world? What is the mind such that it can know the world? And what is the world such that it can know, be known by the mind? Now, one thing that you might think is that we could approach this from the point of view of uh, the, the brain in the vat thought experiment. So the brain in the vat, we were setting it up like this. You've got this spoon that is external to the mind or external to the brain. And there's this idea which is inside of the mind. Now, we could say this is a general picture of realism, and maybe realism leads to skepticism. If the spoon is out here, and what's in here is just the idea of the spoon, then for all you know, there is no spoon. So realism leads to skepticism. Realism, the view that spoons are objective, the spoons exist outside of your mind, leads to the view that maybe you can't have any knowledge of spoons. You might say, well, obviously we have knowledge of the spoon. I know that there are spoons. Well, how is that possible? Well, maybe the way it's possible is that the spoon just exists in your mind. There's no real spoon outside of your mind. Maybe spoons are just subjective. And so it doesn't matter whether you're a brain in a vat or not. You still have the idea of spoon. You can have knowledge of that. And so there's nothing to worry about. So one way of putting some of these points is to say that when we think about epistemology, we're also led to think about metaphysics. When we think about knowledge, we are also led to think about the ultimate nature of the things known, the way in which they exist or the way in which they have reality. And sometimes in discussing metaphysics, we discuss the possibility that the nature of existence is, at bottom, subjective. That there's no objective spoon, it is merely subjective. And the contrary point, is to say that spoons have an objective reality. The spoons would exist independently of whether they are thought about or perceived. One way to approach the view that um, reality perhaps is subjective, or at least partially subjective, is through certain puzzling cases about the nature of things that exist. Many of the things that we think exist are material things, and many of those material things are things we think of as having parts, or things that we think of as being, in some way, complex. So take, for example, a pile of sand, or a, a heap of sand. It's complex in the sense that there's thousands of grains of sand that make it up. Um, in some sense, a heap of sand is not simply a single thing. It's made out of a whole bunch of things. And in contemplating material objects, we are contemplating things that have parts, and that leads to certain interesting puzzles about the relationship of the existence of holes and the existence of their parts. There's a very famous puzzle or paradox known as the puzzle or paradox of the heap. Uh, this word, sorieties, is... Uh, a Greek word for, for heap. This is the famous Sorieties Paradox. One way we, we can put the Sorieties Paradox is to compare 
a single grain of sand to a thousand grains of sand. If you had a thousand grains of sand, you'd have a heap of sand. If you had one grain of sand, you would not have a heap of sand. That is some sand, but it's not a heap of sand. Now, if we add, if we start with one grain of sand and we add grains of sand, we have two grains of sand and then we have three grains of sand. Is there some point at which we suddenly have a heap of grains of sand? And if so, what point is it? If you just have one grain of sand, that's not a heap of sand. If you just have two grains of sand, that doesn't seem like that's a heap of sand either. And I didn't put three on here, but what if there were three grains of sand? That doesn't seem like it's a heap either. But at some point, it seems like you do have to have a, a, a heap because obviously, eventually you're gonna have a thousand grains of sand. So is that the point, the point where you go from 99 to 1,000? But wait a minute, if you just remove one grain of sand from a heap of 1,000 grains of sand, you're still going to have a heap. It's just going to have 99 grains in it. So one way you might ask the question is instead of starting with one grain of sand and thinking about adding one additional grain of sand, you might start with 1,000 grains of sand and start removing grains of sand one at a time. And you could ask, is there some point in here in which removing a single grain of sand makes the difference between a heap and not a heap? Could there be something that is a heap of sand, but then you take away just one grain of sand and what you have left is not a heap of sand anymore? That doesn't seem to make any sense at all. And so you might say that there's something very weird going on here. There's something weird about heaps of sand. There's nothing weird about individual grains of sand, but it's the heaps of sand that somehow have a weird existence. And one thing that some philosophers have been tempted by is the proposition that maybe heaps of sand aren't really real. Now, it sure seems like there are heaps of sand. Is the proper thing to say that the existence of a heap of sand is somehow subjective? That heaps of sand exist only in the mind? But the grains of sand are objective, they exist outside of the, the mind. So these sorts of puzzling cases lead us to contemplate the ultimate nature of existence and wonder to what degree existence is something that is objective or instead is subjective. One way we could put the puzzle of the heap and the way it leads us to the possibility that at least some of existence is subjective in this way is to say that when we're moving from one grain of sand to two grains of sand to 998 to 999, there's nothing objective that seems to distinguish heaps from non-heaps of sand. The, the objective facts of the matter just have to do with whether you have one grain versus two grains versus three grains, but nothing objective tells you when you get a grain of uh, just a, a bunch of grains of sand and when you get enough grains of sand to be a heap. So if there's no objective fact that distinguishes heaps from non-heaps and there is a distinction between heaps and non-heaps, then that distinction must be something that's subjective. The distinction between heaps and non-heaps, if it isn't anything objective, then it would have to be subjective. And so in some sense, heaps of sand only exist in your mind. Let's take a little bit of time for some study questions. We're getting close to the end of this discussion. Again, these, uh, just like in the last video, these study questions are supposed to be about that present video. You should be able to understand the answers to these questions just based on having watched the video. And if you don't, uh, maybe you should watch the video again. Okay, study question number one concerns divine command theory, and it's set up in such a way that you're supposed to complete the sentence here. So divine command theory, A, says that morality is essentially connected to religion. B, is specifically Christian. C, has to at least be monotheistic. D, was endorsed by Plato. Or E, only applies to Muslims. Which of these is the right answer? And uh, I should say, for all the multiple choice questions that you encounter in this class, what you're looking for is the best answer. So um, there's only one best answer. Which one is it? Study question two. 
in the Euthyphro, so in the dialogue called the Euthyphro, um, written by Plato, Plato asked the question. So what's the question? In the Euthyphro, Plato asked, A, why is knowledge better than mere true belief? B, what is the nature of justice? C, who let the dogs out? D, are we morally obliged to obey the law? E, are things good because God loves them? Or does he love them because they are good? And then finally, study question three is a true or false question. So, true or false? The point of the story of the false belief task, that is the story of Sally and Anne, is to show the truth, belief, and knowledge are all the same thing. So A for true or B for false. A little bit later in this video I'll give you the answers, but maybe you'll take a little bit of time before looking at the answers to see if you know the answers on your own. Okay, so in this video I talked about three of the six or seven main topics that we're going to study in this course, and those three topics correspond to the three main branches of philosophy. Those three main branches are metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics. And ethics is probably the easiest to understand of those three, it, in, the, in the sense that it's easy to understand what it is. Um, ethics is the study of value. It has to do with the value of actions, like right and wrong. Are, what actions are you morally obligated to perform? Which are you morally prohibited per, from performing? Are you morally obligated to pull that lever and divert the trolley and save five lives? Or instead, are you morally obligated to just stand by and let nature take its course or let the trolley take its course? The second branch of philosophy that we talked about was epistemology, and this is the branch of philosophy that concerns questions having to do with knowledge. Questions like, what is the source of knowledge? What is the difference between knowledge and belief? Do you, do you know anything at all? Do you know anything at all about things outside of your mind? And finally, we talked about the branch of philosophy known as metaphysics. Metaphysics and epistemology are, are similar and sometimes kind of hard to tell the difference because um, the questions they ask are, are so closely related. One of the main relations is that we can ask this question about how it is that we can know the world and, and what the world is like so that we can know it. There's metaphysical questions about the nature of the mind and also the nature of reality. What are they like? And we wonder how they fit together in such a way that can give rise to knowledge. We took a look at a certain puzzle case in metaphysics, and that's the puzzle case of the heap, the heap of sand, where it looks like while there's obviously a difference between a heap of sand and a single grain of sand, a single grain of sand is not a heap, but a thousand grains of sand is a heap, there isn't a single point in the series from one grain of sand, two grains of sand, all the way up to 1,000, where you go from a heap to a non-heap or vice versa. And that made us wonder whether being a heap is something that is not fully objective and is instead at least partially subjective. In all of the cases we focused on the role of reason, we looked at sample arguments in connection with all three of those branches and that's one of the main purposes of this philosophy course is to understand the main arguments that are connected to these various philosophical positions. In each case, we're interested in reason. What are the reasons for believing these things? What are the reasons for thinking that maybe a heap of sand doesn't have a fully objective existence? What are the reasons for thinking that maybe you don't know whether you're a brain in a vat? What are the reasons for thinking maybe you ought to pull the lever in the trolley problem? Well, we're almost at the end of the video. Uh, let me give you the answers to the study questions. And the answers are... For question one, the answer is A. For two, the answer is E. And for question three, the answer is B. Well, that brings us to the end of lecture two. This is Dr. Mandic, and I will see you at lecture three. All right, bye-bye.